the auspices. And it is my pleasure to introduce the panelists today. We have a lot of time together. Sandy and I had lunch earlier this week, and we remarked that uh, at the idea of this theme, is America governable, seemed like a good idea when he first had it, and in the interim, it's only gotten to be a better idea. <laughs> the question has gotten only more interesting in the interim. And so we have a terrific array of folks who are going to discuss each individually for about 10 minutes, and then as a group, we'll visit, and then we'll open it up for questions. And so it'll be a really good use of the time we have, I think, on a very important topic, and one that with each passing day, uh, the absurdity of governance in this country, I think, becomes clearer to us. We need uh, more with each passing day, so what a perfect opportunity to talk. Let me introduce the panelists alphabetically uh, in order, and, uh, and then we'll hand the mic over, as it were, and let them get started. Uh, next to Sandy, to his immediate left, is the Honorable Mickey Edwards, who represented Oklahoma's 5th Congressional District for 16 years, serving as a senior member of both the House Budget and Appropriations Committees and as chairman of the Republican Policy Committee. He then taught at Harvard University for 11 years at Princeton for another five before joining the Astrid Institute as Vice President. Among his books is one that I think is especially relevant for tonight's discussion, The Parties Versus the People, How to Turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans. <laughs> uh, Mickey has an undergraduate degree from the University of Oklahoma and a law degree from Oklahoma City University. To his left uh, is Bill Galson, who is both the Ezra Zilka Chair in the Governance Studies Program at the Brookings Institution, where he is a senior fellow and college park professor at the University of Maryland. In Bill Clinton's first term, he served as deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy, and he once upon a time taught in the government department at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author of eight books, including Liberal Pluralism and Public Matters. He has an undergraduate degree from Cornell and a master's degree and a PhD from the University of Chicago. In addition to being our gracious host, Sandy Levinson is the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood Jr. Centennial Chair in Law at the University of Texas. Law School, where he's been on the faculty for more than 30 years. Previously taught in the Department of Politics at Princeton. The most recent of his five books is Framed, America's 51 Constitutions and the Crisis of Governance, a great book I recommend you get and read. He has an undergraduate degree from Duke University, PhD from Harvard, and a law degree from Stanford. Thomas Mann is the W. Averill Harriman Chair and Senior Fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution, where he previously served as Director of Government Studies. Over the years, he's taught at Princeton, Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, the University of Virginia, and American University. He is the co-author with our fellow panelist, his fellow panelist, Norman Ornstein, of the recently released It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. Basically, everybody has a book that feels enormously germane <laughs> to the topic tonight. Uh, Thomas has an undergraduate degree from the University of Florida, a master's degree and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Norman Ornstein, aforementioned, is the most quotable expert on Congress in my lifetime, no kidding. He is a columnist for Roll Call, an election eve analyst for CBS News, and a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he served in a variety of capacities, including as co-director of the AEI Brookings Election Reform Project, and is a participant in AEI's Election Watch series. He has an undergraduate degree from the University of Minnesota, and a master's degree and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Finally, last but not least, Alan Wolf is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Boise Center for Religion and Public Life at Boston College. He is the author of more than 20 books, including, here it is again, Does American Democracy Still Work? He is also a regular contributor to the Big Thought Leader magazine. It's a long list of them you can see in your program. He has an undergraduate degree from Temple University and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished That has taken so long, we now have to go good night, everybody. Uh, no, actually, we're going to begin uh, down on the end with uh, Representative Edwards, uh, who I think will begin in alphabetical order with his remarks. We're going to do about 10 minutes from each panelist, and then we'll uh, begin the conversation among the three. I always thought I should change my name to how it works, so that <laughs> I, I would be going first. So, well, I'm really delighted to be here, and, and uh, part of the, the panel and, and all of the people uh, from the academic world and, and professional world that are here, uh, it's because of Sandy, who uh, obviously has the ability to get people just call them and say, "Will you come here and be part of something with me, Sandy?" And everybody wants to do that, and, and uh, you know, I'm honored to be uh, included in that. Uh, so we're going to talk about the state of our union. Wow, uh, that's an interesting topic, and it's a good way to start the question of uh, whether or not 
uh, this country is governable. And uh, so in, in the discussions and the stuff that Sandy sent out to us and others, there's always this reference to uh, dysfunction and the dysfunction of government. It's interesting to try to think about what that means because uh, our economy is recovering. The wars are winding down. Uh, the results of our elections are honored. Uh, Supreme Court decisions are accepted. Uh, we have a lot of very vigorous debate about all kinds of issues, which is, in fact, the hallmark of a democracy and something that uh, many other places in the world wish they had. Uh, so we, we, we've got polarization, but we've had polarization uh, even, even worse than other times in our history. So the question is, is it dysfunctional? Why do people even like me? Why do I keep talking about uh, the fact that our system is dysfunctional? And it, it's because all of those indicators aside, and they're very good indicators that make us feel good about the fact that in fact our country does still function and, and our democracy functions, but there are real other problems, maybe too many national problems, and, and there are going to mix government problems for government and problems in society, because the question is, for this, the State of our Union, uh, and problems that we have collectively that uh, either remain un unresolved or completely uh, unaddressed. Uh, and some of those problems, for example, uh, maintaining our, our national transportation infrastructure, ensuring adequate energy supplies beyond the immediate future, dealing with the prohibitively high cost sometimes of housing and of health care, uh, declining support for the humanities. Our, our great universities are turning into both tech schools, teaching people how to get jobs rather than how to learn literature and critical thinking and uh, understand what's required in a democracy. We have inadequate care for the mentally ill. We have failed oversight of the exploitation by financial uh, systems and uh, all of these things, and we, we can go on and on and talk about guns or whatever. So, so even though a lot of the big indicators about what is a democracy and what's a workable democracy, you know, are there, they said we're still working, there are so many problems that remain unresolved in our society and that our uh, government is supposed to be dealing with. And the reason for that is that and these are not problems that are intractable. They are collective problems. They challenge us as a society, and we operate in a system of elections and governance that values divisiveness, that rewards intransigence, that punishes collaboration, and punishes cooperation with people who belong to a different political club. So it is the fact that we have difficulty coming to grips with these many, many problems because people have been locked into extreme certitude on so many different things, including the people we send to Washington uh, and to our state legislatures. So why is that? So I want to begin with three assertions, or end with three assertions, whichever. Um, the first is the necessity in a self-governing, democratic, constitutional government to have political parties, despite the title uh, of my book, which I happen to think is the right title, about the parties versus the people. You know, we do need parties. Uh, democracies, functioning, vibrant democracies, require uh, parties because we require people to be able to come together around common values and have vigorous debate. The problem has become in this regard that the parties have begun to drive the system for their own advantage, for their own gaining of power, and not for the public good. And it goes beyond what they believe, the policies they believe are good, but actually an erosion of the processes which really define uh, a democratic system. The second is that we, we have this problem where we have created an inverse, reverse, perverse political and governing system that does the following. A bottom line part of our democratic constitutional system is that the final decisions are made by the people. That's why the major part of the power of the federal government is not in the executive branch, but in the legislative branch. 
almost every major power is finally in the legislative branch with the idea that the people themselves in speaking will govern the decisions that uh, our government makes. But we now do the following things. In order to arise at a position of power, getting into uh, the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House or state legislatures, you first have to run through a, you talk about good ideas that have unintended consequences, the progressive reforms of the late 1800s, early 1900s, or that we went to the party primary system, which was a good idea, but it's closed party primaries and it's closed party conventions. And the result of it, I've used a couple of these examples in my book, which are, are quite well known to you, because you first have to get through this hurdle to get past the hardline ideologues in order to get your nomination. Uh, in the state of uh, Delaware, which I mentioned, you all know these, where, where Christine O'Donnell beat Mike Castle by getting 30,000 votes in the state of a million people. Or in Utah, where Robert Bennett's career ended when he only got 2,000 people, 2,000 in a state convention in a state of 3 million people voted against renominating him for the Senate. And his career was ended because we have combined two terrible ideas. One is a closed party primary or convention coupled with the fact that 46 of our 50 states have sore loser laws that say if you sought your party's nomination in a primary or a convention and you did not win it, you cannot have your name appear on the ballot in November. There's something fundamentally wrong with that because what happens then is that the Mike Castles and the Robert Bennett's people who get cited here so frequently as what we would like to see in our government making these decisions get washed out by people who do not value compromise, do not value cooperation. And the result of it is that you have a Congress that's not speaking for the people, but is speaking for the hardline subset of the people. And they're the ones who refuse to talk and cooperate with people on the other side. We do the same thing in redistricting where, I mean, there's 20 stories a day, uh, big ones in Virginia today, where the uh, parties are able to redraw district lines for their party advantage, thereby changing the nature of the people who get elected and electing people like me. I mean, I, I love serving, and I, I don't want to get the people to repeal that. It was great fun. Uh, but I'm a city guy. I'm a total city guy. I ended up representing wheat farmers and cattle ranchers. I didn't understand their problems. I couldn't speak for them. I couldn't advocate for their causes because it served the party's advantage. I'm a Republican who won in a district that had not elected a Republican since 1928 and drove the other party crazy. Uh, and so they redistricted me. And for a long time, I'm sorry, uh, but politicians said to be self-referential and all about me. I thought about, look what they've done to me. They didn't do it to me. The Constitution says that every senator and representative must be an actual inhabitant of the state from which they're elected. The idea is, if you elect me, I know your area, I know your economic concerns, I know your perspectives, and, and that gave us the representative function. So that's gone too. So uh, when you combine those things, Larry Lessig is going to talk later about, about money, which has been a very corrosive injection of new ideas. But what we have uh, and that's making our system dysfunctional is in Washington you have today not representatives of the American people, but people who do not talk to each other, who do not value each other, who do not listen to each other when somebody else speaks, uh, and who are looking over their shoulders to avoid getting primary by being as intransigent and nasty and uncivil and uncompromising as they can be. Therefore, my conclusion, our system works, it produces a terrible result, but it works exactly the way it was designed to work. We have now created a system which does not honor cooperation and compromise, which are essential to a big democratic system, you know, but reward the opposite, and that's exactly what we get. And that's why our system's dysfunctional and why the state of our union is in disrepair. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Representative. We're going to uh, skip Bill Galston out of deference to him for his long travel there, but we'll let him go last. So we're going to go to Sandy Levis. Uh, I'm going to apologize because uh, usually, as a law professor, I'm used to um, yeah, more, more or less swinging it. 
But because I want to stay within 10 minutes, I've actually written some remarks, and I'm likely to stay within 10 minutes if I more or less read them. Um, so, how does one assess the State of the Union? One might look at certain subjective measures. How much do Americans approve of the current operation of their key institutions? Consider Congress, and I agree with Mickey that Congress is, from a democratic perspective, the most important of the institutions. Indeed, one of the ominous features of American government, which we'll talk about presumably more tomorrow, is the degree to which breakdowns in the legislature uh, are leading to more and more uh, exertions of executive authority, uh, some of which I might approve, but that's a different matter. Um, but with regard to Congress, the most recent Gallup poll shows that of January 7, 10, 2013, 14% of those polled approved of Congress, while 81%, that is roughly four-fifths, disapprove. 6% have no opinion. As a matter of fact, Congress has not broken through to majority approval since 1981, 1998, um, save for the Halcyon days immediately after September 11th, um, 2001, where literally overnight an approval rating on September 10th of 42% skyrocketed to about 80%. Um, and it's been all downhill since then. 14% incidentally is actually a quite dramatic jump from roughly a year ago when the number was 10% labeled by the Gallup organization as an historic low. Now President Obama does do considerably better according to Gallup. He entered inauguration day with a 50% rate of approval uh, which correlates almost perfectly with the roughly 50%, 51 or 52% of the vote he got, and one assumes that many Republicans continue to disapprove of him, I suspect even more strongly than during the election, given uh, his very progressive, from you know, my point of view, inaugural address, um, uh, which, which certainly drew certain lines in the sand. sand. I suspect that Jim Gibson and Adam Liptak will be speaking tomorrow about the approval ratings of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, though they too, if you look simply at approval of the Supreme Court, are roughly at a historic low. They were at 44% uh, at one point during the summer. I think they got just to a little bit over 50%. But this still, as I say, is below what used to be the case. If one looks at the answers to how well are things going in the country today, a fair majority, that is 51%, answers pretty badly or very badly. 3% astonishingly say very well. Um, and frankly, I don't, can't imagine exactly what you're thinking. Um, uh, there are also polls asking about general trust in various levels of government. As of autumn 2012, an impressive majority, that is 55%, had a great deal or fair amount of trust that government would handle foreign affairs competently. A bare 51% majority Perhaps those comprised of those who voted President Obama had the same degree um, of confidence on the domestic side. Or consider the response to another Gallup poll on, quote, how much of the time do you think you can trust government in Washington to do what is right? Just about always, most of the time, or only some of the time? At least in 2010, only 19% said always, most of the time, while 81% offered a more pessimistic answer. Still, what do I want to make of this data? I have suggested, for example, not altogether kiddingly, that King George and the British Parliament might have registered better numbers in 1775. But so what, even if that's true? Nobody believes that the United States is even close to a revolutionary situation. Indeed, and this picks up a bit on what Mickey said, what is most striking is the remarkable docility of the American public, where disruption by the Tea Party of town meetings in 2010 brought forth anguished discussion, though frankly they were extraordinarily minor as genuinely radical protests, protests go. Uh, indeed, I should confess at this point that I was part of the crowd, mob, group, however you describe it, in either 1965 or 1966, 
that block Robert McNamara's sojourn through uh, Harvard, uh, where we wanted more than this canned speech on the glories of the Vietnam War. Um, so, um, you know, it seems to me that radical protest, um, including what in the 19th century was called mobbing, is as American as apple pie. And we really have, as I say, a remarkably docile policy when all is said and done um, um, at present. So if governability and the State of the Union are measured by docility and acquiescence to what government does, even if one finds it objectionable or even wretched, then the State of the Union is just fine. But then, how do we make sense of the fact that pundits and commentators across the political spectrum regularly describe the American system of government as dysfunctional, and even in Tom Friedman's <coughs> word, pathological? Or that Norm Ornstein and Tom Mann have written a much discussed and insightful book titled, It's Even Worse Than It Looks. To make sense of such perceptions, and in fact, I suggest in the email to Tom and Norm that perhaps their next book should be titled, How Much Worse Can It Get? <laughs> One has to move from subjective analysis, that is, how are people feeling about the country these days, or what are they actually willing to do in terms of organizing significant protest movements, to a different claim, in which one asserts the presence of objective problems that are not being adequately uh, confronted. And here again, I agree with Mickey. No doubt, depending on our own politics, we might highlight different problems. Getting a handle on medical expenses, especially as high-tech medicine becomes ever more pervasive. Immigration, financing Social Security, lowering our collective debt, global warming, a host of foreign policy problems in various regions of the world, providing jobs for millions of Americans, confronting the remarkable inequality that now characterizes our politics, and according to the economist uh, Joseph Stiglitz, it is deforming our politics. Many would also mention the corrupting role of campaign finance, which will undoubtedly be addressed tomorrow by Larry Lessig and others, the role of highly ideological and undisciplined talk radio and cable news, the demise of traditional media, the breakdown of the willingness to compromise, again, the topic of a panel tomorrow morning, uh, and so on. My own view is that the State of the Union is somewhere between bleak and dire, Precisely because I too look at the kinds of problems the solution are crucial, not so much to my own life at this point um, in the age span, but to the lives of my two daughters and three granddaughters. And I have no confidence whatsoever that we are or will confront them in any adequate way. I don't know how much the other panels of the panel disagree with me in terms of that diagnosis. Um, where I'm confident that we do disagree is that my own view is that part of the explanation for the dire straits we're in is the Constitution of the United States. Uh, that in the list of things that cause uh, the winter of our discontent, uh, one almost never finds any mention of the Constitution. Indeed, uh, you find, and here's where uh, I, I've become almost obsessed about Tom Friedman on this point, that in his recent book, which certainly is not optimistic about the state of American politics, he praises the Constitution for having contributed to our growth as a union, which may be true. I don't think the Constitution is all bad. I just find it remarkable, indeed bizarre, from a social science or historical perspective, that one would believe that the Constitution has generated only good and has no downside. And my view is, at the present, its downsides are um, uh, very important uh, and indeed potentially toxic, um, even if one gives due weight to the other things. If you didn't have all these other problems, it wouldn't matter that we have, in many ways, a lousy constitution. But when you blend it with these other problems, then it does matter a great deal. So let me conclude by quoting the founder, um, uh, Alexander Hamilton, who in the first Federalist said that the challenge facing the people of this young republic were to demonstrate that it was possible to engage in genuine reflection and choice with regard to what kind of governmental system we want to live under. 
What makes me most despair about the state of our union today is not only the objective problems facing it, but the fact that there seems to be almost no genuine reflection about whether we might need to engage in constitutional reform, and thus no genuine sense that we can choose how to govern ourselves rather than passively acquiesce in a set of choices made for us in Philadelphia some 225 years ago under assumptions about the United States and the world that just have remarkably little purchase on the world we live in in 2013. with an onion uh, headline because where else do we get better indicators of uh, <laughs> the state of our politics and society uh, in the current issue uh, reflecting on the results of the election in the same political configuration. The headline says, list of politically achievable reforms down to just three minor changes to traffic code. <laughs> That's pretty much uh, uh, where we are. Uh, I mean, we all know in our in our hearts and minds that you know the state of our union is better than many people think it is. That we we've, we've come out of extraordinarily difficult conditions. Uh, whole, we're doing better than Europe uh, uh, as far as the economic recovery is, uh, is, is coming. And, and uh, the flight around the globe to the dollar and the negative interest rates we have to pay to borrow money tells us something about the durability and, and the acceptance of the United States of America as a, as a great country. Uh, that is true. What is also true is that we are the laughing stock of uh, not only our own citizens, but, but leaders and citizens around the world. So what is the matter with you? You are supposed to be the, the greatest country, but uh, you really can't get your act together. You, uh, you try, you talk so much about American exceptionalism, but you forget What's exceptionable, exceptionable about America is that we've, uh, we've never been so enamored of ourselves and, uh, and our, our government uh, and so convinced that we have it all right that when things aren't going well, we, we kind of roll up our sleeves and go to work and try to fix it. But my, my sense is now there is this broad, Malaise, the sense that it's just all gone wrong. It all looks so bad. It isn't working. Why can't those people just get together in Washington and make it uh, uh, make it work? Uh, that is, there is this this sense of uh, uh, almost a tyranny of diminished expectations now about our country, our politics, our government. Uh, we accept banalities for debate and the greatest deliberative body, supposedly, uh, in, the, in, the, in the world. And we hear absolute nonsense regularly stated by many of our leaders that we know simply have no fact value to them at all. And yet we pretend and go through elaborate processes of energy and competition uh, producing very little in, of a satisfying way. Yeah, we rise to the occasion thanks to George W. Bush and Ben Bernanke and Paulson and, and for the most part, Democrats in Congress, we pass TARP um, and we have done things that we had to do administratively, sometimes legislatively, sometimes presidents going on their own um, uh, because of the problems in the first branch of, uh, of government. But 
The fact is, it is different, and I think it's a our natural instinct as as scholars, as students, of uh, is to say, relax. Things aren't so bad. We've seen this before. We've had periods like this in American history. Around the War of 1812, the pre-Civil War, the post-Reconstruction, Gilded Age, we've come out of it. There are self-correcting mechanisms that are embedded in our system, and if we simply acknowledge our problems, we'll, we'll use democratic accountability and some creative, entrepreneurial, constructive leadership and, and work our way out of, uh, out of this system. There's a, there's a complacency, uh, uh, I think, that most of us fall into, and I think probably fair to say Norm and I were part of that for decades in Washington, trying to explain to people outside, this isn't supposed to look good, and it's messy, and it's slow, and you know, there been, but, but there are such strengths underlying it that you have to see and understand it. But uh, we've concluded over time now, and it's taken us two books to, to actually get to that point, that in fact, it isn't just like always, or what we've seen before, uh, that in fact there are some serious problems. We lay, we lay out uh, in very simple terms the two major problems that relate in part to what, uh, 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 to what Mickey and Sandy had said. First of all, uh, a problem identified by our dear late colleague Austin Ranny many years ago that uh, our constitutional system and extra constitutional uh, arrangements and procedures uh, don't sit well with uh, parliamentary like parties, uh, with highly ideological adversarial uh, parties who are in the position of opposition, strategic opposition. It's partly ideological differences, but it's more than that. It's a it's, and it's not just a permanent campaign, it's a permanent war in which the parties engage to control power. We, we know that, we understand political incentives. But in our system uh, of government, without forming parliamentary majorities, single party or coalitional, and, and a government being able to put its programs into place, and the minority party prepared to use any means, uh, whatever the cost, uh, to make that government uh, fail, then we put ourselves in an extremely difficult position and, and subject ourselves to serious self-inflicted wound. So first of all, our system's out of sync. Uh, it's partly constitutional, separate elections, midterm elections, it's partly extra constitutional, like the development of the filibuster in the Senate that <coughs> created the problem. But more than that, much more than that, uh, 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 something is amiss that it's not polite to talk about. Uh, uh, and that is that one of our great political parties has, has veered far off uh, the tracks uh, in almost every conceivable way. Uh, it's, it's, they are ideologically extreme. They are contemptuous of a policy regime that's been developing at least since Theodore Roosevelt. They are scornful of compromise, uh, uh, dismissive of facts, evidence, and science. And perhaps worst of all, they are uh, they simply don't accept the legitimacy of their political opposition, which means anything is fair game if the other side really aren't Americans and would, pur and would purport to undermine our Constitution and turn us into something very different. We believe, I believe, uh, that uh, that is the ingredient for a very, very difficult policy. And that's what we have been going through. It's developed for decades, but it's taken on uh, special uh, significance uh, as 
manifest since the election of, uh, of Barack Obama. Now, you think, what, well, what do we do about this? You know, we can think as political scientists, we always do, but then we pull back because of the infamous law of unintended consequences. But we think of structural changes to make the institutions of our government fit the nature of our parties better, or alternatively, try to change our parties through electoral uh, reforms. The problem is we don't have the political basis for enacting any of these uh, changes now because of the nature of the war that's involved and the way in which everything is seen in terms of short-term partisan gain. When you're at a position of parity, these are the things that happen. So we have zillions of groups and people and books being written about these problems and saying, what are we going to do about it? One approach is, well, we've got to build bipartisanship. But we have a, John's not here yet, but he'll be here, John Fortier, our dear friend of ours, uh, at the Bipartisan Policy Center. We have zillions of commissions that are, that are bipartisan, we say, of people outside the the elected bodies get together, work out a reasonable compromise, they can then give it to those inside, and that will ease, ease the way. Uh, another approach is sort of nonpartisanship. Let's reduce uh, the meaning of party in any way we can. And Mickey's got some ideas for inside Congress, the ways in which you try to diminish it. The other effort, and Bill has been involved with some of these, is to is, is to let the parties be there, but build up other entities that try to create some common ground. In this case, it, uh, it's the no labels movement. Um, I think our orientation, and I, I'll let Norm speak for himself, and I'll just say, uh, uh, I'll mine. speak for you. <laughs> He'll speak for me, I'll speak for him. Um, is, is, is really, if we're going to deal with this anytime soon, we're going to have to think in terms of partisanship and incentives and realpolitik, not let's all get together and be more civil to one another and sing kumbaya around the campfire. Uh, we've got to acknowledge the realities of, uh, of the forces that are driving our, uh, our politics. And, if that's correct, uh, there's, there's two ways we're going to get out of this. Uh, one is that the Republicans are going to go so far off track and refuse to come back in that Democrats will become a dominant party again. We will go through a period of time with a one-party dominant system sufficient to move legislation uh, through a Senate. Uh, even with uh, with the filibuster operating, or uh, or change it, that's that's not impossible to imagine. But people have been waiting for a political realignment for a for a long time. But if I were a Democratic politician, I'd sure as hell be thinking in terms of of that as a goal more than trying to reach agreement with a with a party that's so committed to my destruction. Okay, a second. Uh, a second way, uh, and in, in my own sense, it's the preferred way. It's, it's to generate incentives to remake, reposition, or replace uh, the GOP. Uh, it's to bring the Republican Party, I, you're laughing, Bruce, I knew you'd like that one, uh, to bring the Republican Party back to reality. I don't have time, it's 10 minutes, but we could give chapter and verse. It's gone wacko. Uh, there's just no question about it on, on every substantive and procedural ground. But that means the public seeing what we think exists out there and the politicians acting in a way that, that makes it clear. Um, and, and this is my closing uh, line. I actually take some optimism out of this. I think the next book could have an upbeat title to it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I really do, because inside an election that seemed to be a status quo election with the same party, the people, manning the same institutions, we saw a reality. The Republicans went for broke in a way that's almost unprecedented in American history. David 
will correct me if, if, if this is wrong in there. In the, vigilance to oppose everything and anything that the president favored. And if, if, if not to kill it, to slow it down, obstruct it, to discredit it, to nullify it, you name it, because the object was, if he's destroyed, then we're back in power, and that's the name of the game. Uh, before the election, the public uh, didn't see one party or the other as sort of more extreme and far from them. If anything, Democrats seem to be further from the median voter. Now, it's striking how much the public believes the Republican Party is more extreme, um, and their brand, in every respect, is substantially lower than what the, what the Democrats uh, is. So, the optimism out of this is that even though you still have this divided uh, government and ideological polarization, you actually are in a position where uh, you could maneuver in a way using the weakness of the Republican Party as a presidential coalition going forward to get some Republicans to see it's in their interest, not just to get re-elected to save seats, but to be in a position to govern and having, having a fellow party member in government. And it seems to me a very interesting dynamic may develop in this Congress that will give us some hope. All right. Uh, Thanks, Evan. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, we, we are, I'm sure, going to make this a trilogy, and I thank Sandy for mentioning the book and offering a title. I have two alternate titles for our third, third book, going from The Broken Branch to It's Even Worse Than the Books. I hope we don't have to use Run For Your Lives. <laughs> the uh, preferred title for the uh, uh, slam dunk bestseller is uh, 535 Shades of Grey. <laughs> nice. Uh, I did uh, want to make a comment. Sandy mentioned the, the uh, polls uh, on the approval of Congress. Uh, actually, the most interesting poll is one that showed that Head Lice and Donald Trump were uh, more popular. Than <laughs> and I should note that the Head Lice are extremely unhappy at being compared to Donald Trump. There are uh, there is some good news uh, out there. Um, the uh, re-election of uh, a black president is in many ways more profound than the election of a, of a black president. Uh, and uh, having that happen with a clear majority of popular votes uh, and a uh, substantial majority of electoral votes uh, is cause for all Americans, I think, uh, to uh, celebrate. Um, Following the election, we averted the threat of economic catastrophe that could easily have happened with another confrontation uh, over the uh, debt limit. Uh, we could make a case, I could make a strong case for a remarkably productive uh, second term for Barack Obama, much more than we usually find with uh, second terms across a range of areas, some of which, uh, if we had been doing this conference six months ago, uh, immigration, guns, we would have said that there was close to a zero chance of any uh, action being taken. But for a variety of reasons, they're uh, on the agenda and there are some prospects. Uh, you could imagine prospects of getting past the economic impasse uh, and uh, maybe even reaching a point where we become uh, yet again a global engine for uh, economic growth. The second term prospects are uh, potentially favorable in part, I think, because perhaps perversely, the nature of the permanent campaign could turn around the whole idea of a lame duck president uh, having deep weaknesses. If Mitch McConnell's uh, first term goal was to make Barack Obama a one term president, uh, if his second term goal becomes making him a two term president, <laughs> mission accomplished. Uh, but under those circumstances, there may be incentives actually for Senate Republicans now, and many of them I think feel this way, to get down and solve some problems. Uh, partly for reasons that Tom suggested and that some of Sandy's numbers suggested, that if Republicans want to compete for a majority in the Senate next time around, 
being identified as the obstructionist and extreme party is not going to be helpful. Uh, they did go for broke, uh, and, and uh, it didn't work this time. At the same time, there are a number of prominent Republican leaders, from Jeb Bush to Mitch Daniels uh, to Haley Barber to Chris Christie, who have recognized that if they don't change uh, fundamentally many elements of the party, not just uh, on one narrow issue like immigration, uh, their ability to appeal, given the demographics of the country, to a broader group, to compete for a majority. It doesn't mean you can't win elections, but uh, you'll only win if things are so bad that people say anything would be better than this. Uh, and they're out there beating the drums. And one of the reasons that the uh, uh, economic catastrophe with the debt limit was avoided is that unlike a year ago, the business community got engaged this time and uh, many of them at least uh, saying that this simply can't happen. Now the bad news. Uh, at a fundamental level, we have entered an era of tribalism. And uh, that's, this is not just simply a, a sharp ideological and partisan uh, polarization that we have. Indeed, in many of these issues, as we'll see, uh, from immigration to dealing with our fiscal problems, Every time you pull together a group that spans the ideological spectrum outside the hothouse, they manage to come up with common ground. Many ideas transcend or can <coughs> transcend ideological differences or can result in the kinds of compromises that we all uh, laud. But tribalism, where you basically say, if he's for it, I'm against it, even if I was for it yesterday has become much more dominant. And it's metastasized from our leaders in Washington, clearly out to the states, and to a significantly greater extent to the public uh, as a whole. And it is getting, I think, worse rather than better. And at the same time, the nature of our modern mass media provide business models that demand enhanced tribalism rather than the opposite. If Rush Limbaugh turned around tomorrow and said, you know, I was wrong. Can't we all just get along? I mean, you know, I don't like this guy's politics, uh, but he's a patriotic American, and I bet we can find some common ground to help the country move along. 25 million listeners would try and find somebody else on the dial. If Fox News and Roger Ailes did the same thing I can guarantee you that within a week, uh, there would be a wolf news somewhere on the cable channels that would take the old uh, theme. And two and a half million viewers at any given time of the day would gravitate over there. That makes it much harder. And if you consider the amplification of social media, that enable uh, a set of messages to get out that become echo chambers for people. Uh, and you no longer have any kind of a semblance of a public square where you share a common set of facts and can then begin to uh, argue, hammer and talk about uh, issue positions and try and move towards something else, it becomes much more difficult. And in a tribal environment where 40% of the members of one political party believe that the president is illegitimate because he wasn't born in the United States, uh, that makes it much harder to move in that direction. At the same time, we've seen a decline, partly because of the economic troubles and the populist era, of opinion leaders in almost every area of public life. It's not just Congress that's down, it's virtually everybody else. The only institution that had managed until recently to maintain a lofty standing was the military. Uh, they didn't have uh, figures who uh, got caught up in horrible scandals or other problems. So much for that. Uh, but almost all others are in a different position. And if you think about an earlier era where uh, a Father Hesper could stand up and say something and people would listen, or a Paul Volcker, we just don't have people like that anymore who, if they stand up and say something that is all controversial, don't immediately get labeled as being on one side of the tribal divide. And Warren Buffett could give you uh, volumes uh, about that. Then there's the role of money. And 
the new world of money, it's not just Citizens United, but the post-Citizens United world has moved us even further towards tribalism, but also towards more extreme positions. And while this did not shape the outcome of a presidential campaign, the further you move down the chain, the more the impact of that money gets amplified. In Kansas, a few months ago, the Koch brothers, natives of the state, put a relatively paltry sum, around $3 million, into a series of Republican primary races targeting moderate Republicans and replaced almost all of them with a variety that would be much more in sync with their message and that of the governor. And we're seeing this happen in other states, in North Carolina, in Arkansas, and in other places. And what concerns me as much as anything else is judicial elections. When we travel around the world and lecture to other countries, whether it is emerging democracies or struggling democracies uh, in the Arab uh, Spring areas, in Eastern and Central Europe, or even in established countries like Russia and China, the independent judiciary and the rule of law are the absolute hallmark. If you don't have those, you have nothing. Now imagine a world which Anthony Kennedy has, I think, inadvertently, but utterly foolishly unleashed, where there are no rules governing judicial elections, thanks in part to very concerted efforts by James Bopp and others to get out there and knock down any of the things that made judicial elections distinct. And individuals or companies come in with millions and millions of dollars targeting individual judges in elections. Where are those judges going to raise money? From the people who practice in front of them. But even if they don't, imagine if you're sitting there on the bench and there's a case before you and you know if you rule in a particular way, you're going to have multi-millions spent against you in the next campaign. You may decide to hedge your bets a little bit. And we could well go down a path where, at least below the federal level, the whole notion of an independent judiciary gets thrown uh, upside down and inside out. All of this has led to a growing influence of extremes and uh, the elements of compromise that we see, including the heartening ones on the debt limit, have serious undercurrents of dangers ahead. If you notice when Speaker Boehner trying to find some way to gain leverage in the aftermath of a disastrous election came up with the rather inartfully named Plan B, and I first thought, why is he focusing on a drug that might be sold over the counter? Uh, not the best brand. But was rebuffed by his own partisans because the Club for Growth and Heritage Action and others stood up and said to his colleagues, you lift your head above the foxhole and vote for anything that has a hint of a tax increase, and you've got a primary challenge with millions spent against you. That means you've got a kind of electoral magnet that pulls people away from compromise. We have had this presumed heartening three-month delay in any consideration of what to do about the debt limit that has a lot of people thinking that we're past that. But if you look beneath the surface and see what Boehner had to do to get his House Republican colleagues to agree to a three-month extension of the debt limit, it was to agree that he would push for and they would demand a budget that gets balanced within 10 years. Now consider that the Ryan budget, a budget which an awful lot of people, me included, would view as an extraordinary and extreme budget, brought us to balance in 30 years. And now look at what that would do to the heart of government. And I'm not just talking about entitlement programs, it would actually be worse than that because they pledge not to touch Medicare as part of that plan now for seven years instead of ten. You're talking about basically eliminating homeland security, food safety, medical research, uh, infrastructure, and a whole host of other things. And you have his colleagues saying, we're going to hold his feet to the fire on that. That doesn't make it easy to think about some of those compromises ahead and could well poison the well for uh, any consideration of action on other issues. And if we add to that finally, uh, with all this metastasization at the state levels, the growing willingness of states, with Virginia being the latest in your face example, 
to decide that the way to stay a competitive party is to change the rules to suppress or distort votes through changes in the Electoral College formula or draconian laws, and the strong possibility that some of those will be enacted. Imagine what would happen if in 2016 we had a presidential candidate win 54 or 55 percent of the popular votes denied an Electoral College victory. 2000 would look like a picnic by comparison. So there are serious dangers ahead. Green shoots out there, possibilities of moving past this, but real dangers that I think we need to talk about and try and find ways to rally uh, to make sure that the worst cases uh, do not happen and we don't have to do a book called Run for Your Lives. Norm, thank you. Each of these presentations could be a whole program in another time. Well, to quote the immortal words of Ross Perot's uh, running mate, uh, what am I doing here? <laughs> I actually think I have an answer. Uh, and I believe, and Sandy can correct me if I'm wrong, that perhaps the answer is that a few years back in the Chronicle of Higher Education, I wrote an article which Sandy liked, not everyone else did, uh, in which I said that if you really want to understand what's happening in the Republican Party, and in particular among the more extreme members of the Republican Party, um, the wrong person to look at is Leo Strauss, the German uh, political philosopher who uh, is generally considered to be the intellectual uh, source behind neo Uh The person we really need to pay attention to, I argue, was a Weimar jurist named Carl Schmidt, eventually became a, an early member of the Nazi Party, and was probably the most thorough, consistent, and in many ways eloquent uh, critic of liberalism in the 20th century. Liberalism for Schmidt uh, was not taken in a substantive sense, a uh, belief in the welfare state or anything like that, or even belief in the market. Um, he believed that liberalism understood procedurally. The, li the liberalism that goes into the phrase liberal democracy was fallacious, that there's no such thing uh, as a rule of law, there's no such thing as a neutral position, that everything boils down to what he called the friend-enemy distinction, uh, that people who try to pretend that there's a kind of objective force that can stand above uh, politics and issue rules that will be binding upon all is naive, and that the, the kind of warfare uh, that Tom Mann talked about was really uh, uh, idolized by Schmidt as the only kind of, of politics that, uh, that really made any sense. Uh, at the end of his book, The Concept of the Political, uh, Schmidt identified John Locke, and in that way, uh, Thomas Jefferson and the American Framers as embodying the very kind of liberalism he detested, uh, that their belief in due process of law, their belief in all the things that we've been hearing about an independent judiciary were nonsense, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was uh, concerned that we might be seeing the introduction of a kind of Schmittian element in, in American politics. And to illustrate what I meant, perhaps I could uh, be granted the liberty of talking about an example of extremism and political polarization that in my view is not Schmittian at all. And that's the 40-year argument we've had, 40 years and two-day argument we had since the Supreme Court made its decision in Roe v. Wade. Uh, uh, this is, a, abortion is a deeply polarizing issue. People tend to take extreme positions. There's a great deal of conflict surrounding it. Yet when you think about it, both sides are Lockean. Both sides talk about rights, a right to choose, and a right to life. Both sides respect the legitimacy of political institutions. The anti-abortion forces in America, while I'm not in agreement with their substantive position, I have to respect uh, the democratic energy that's propelled them, that has consistently called upon them to try to get a result through the democratic process more to their liking. It seems to me that's an intense kind of politics, and that's a polarizing kind of politics. But it's a politics that's conducted within the framework of liberal democracy, as we generally understand the term. I wish I could be convinced that efforts to change a redistricting law while one member of the opposition party is attending the president's inaugural, um, uh, or the kind of thing that could result in an uh, uh, electoral uh, uh, college majority 
uh, uh, that would go to a minority candidate in the presidential election was just the kind of politics conducted within the general understanding uh, 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 of liberal proceduralism. But it strikes me as much more Schmidtian than, than Lockean in that sense. It, it really is a, 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 a way of treating your enemy, not as someone who you understand may someday hold the reins of power that you currently have, but an effort to, break, to change the rules uh, so that uh, your power is entrenched. Then, uh, if they would then need your opposition to come back in and to try to change the rules back to more neutral ones, there would be uh, engaged a kind of all-out war or contest uh, uh, over that. My colleagues on this panel have said many things that I'm in agreement with. It seems that underlying our discussion is the question of whether the kinds of uh, negative uh, features of American democracy that we've been pointing to represent anything new, or whether they've always sort of been built in uh, to the structure of, of our institution. Um, I think about this also kind of as a way of riffing on the Schmidt thesis when I think about uh, the kind of language that's used in our politics, a language in which Barack Obama, about as centrist and pragmatic a Democrat as one could ever hope to find if one were a Republican, uh, is accused of being Hitler or Stalin or some combination of the two. The questions about uh, attacking uh, his birth and the legitimacy of whether he can rule. I think about it right now with respect to some of the language we're hearing when the president and vice president proposed a series of, I believe, either 18 or 21 executive orders uh, that would do something about the problem of guns in America, and is met with a comment from one of the state's congressmen, Steve Stockman, uh, that this is Hitlerian and this is grounds for impeachment. Uh, the whole impeachment controversy itself, uh, which no one has mentioned here, uh, of the Clinton years. I don't know anything comparable in our history. Obviously, we had an impeachment previously in our history, but that was over real matters about the nature of the republic as opposed to an effort to deny the legitimacy of a democratic president. So yes, we've had John Birchers, and yes, we've had malicious, uh, but I sense a, a, a truly ugly turn, and a turn that is reaching higher and higher into established levels of power. Dwight D. Eisenhower denounced the John Birch Society in a way that Mitt Romney would never denounce some of the extremists, including Donald Trump. Uh, um, uh, Bill Buckley denounced the John Birch Society. Uh, I, I sense that, th 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 this, this is a minority sentiment, but it's a poisonous sentiment, and it's a dangerous sentiment. And, and finally, I just wanted to conclude on one point, uh, and, and that is the question of the good news that's involved, and I fully agree with Norman Ornstein here, that the, the re-election of Barack Obama is one of the most significant events in our political history, even more significant than his first election. Um, it's a dramatic indication of the way the country has changed. And I wish I could say that it's all good news with respect to the way the issue of race has played out in the United States uh, in these years. Uh, because again, of course, Schmidt wrote at a time when uh, questions about race and the, the illegitimacy of one racial or religious group, the Jews, was at the heart uh, of the Nazi regime. I uh, confess to being somewhat disquieted by uh, the, the, the role that the question of race is playing in some of the reapportionment issues and some of the tampering uh, with uh, voting rights. Uh, I believe the 1965 Voting Rights Act, probably the most significant, single significant piece of civil rights legislation this country has ever passed. Um, more than the 1964 Act. It is very, very difficult for me to understand how anyone, and especially anyone who's white and from the South, could even begin to think about tampering with voting rights. Um, how uh, the Supreme Court uh, could send a suggestion, which it's hinted at so broadly, that it's going to declare uh, the preclearance sections uh, of the Voting Rights Act unconstitutional. Um, when you start having arguments, not over substance, but over who's a citizen and who can vote, uh, it, it seems to me you're on a very dangerous path. So I'd like to share the optimism of my, some of my colleagues here. And I think in some ways, you know, we did avoid the fiscal cliff. Uh, we are going to have a compromise over the filibuster, although not much of one. Um, the Republican Party uh, has broken uh, the Haskett rule a couple of times now, and that's good news. Uh, but when you get outside uh, you know, of Washington and, and you look at 
It's happening in states like Arizona. It's happening uh, uh, in, in Florida and in a number of other states. Um, well, <coughs> I'm an optimist, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's being tempered. Thank you so much. First of all, I, I want to thank uh, the organizer of the conference and the moderator of this panel for allowing me a period of grace so that my basal metabolism rate <laughs> could return to something approaching normal after eight of the most harrowing travel hours I believe I, I have ever spent. Uh, as, you know, as Sandy and Norm were batting around the title for the third volume of the trilogy, I was reminded of one of my favorite scenes and one of my favorite uh, movies, The Producers, uh, you know, where you know, the camera enters you know, Max Bialystok's office, and arrayed there are the placards, all of his great hits, and the first one is The Kidney Stuff, <laughs> followed hard upon by his second hit, This Too Shall Pass. <laughs> well, uh, that would be my title. Uh, so, you know, here's, you know, you know, here's, here's what I'm going to do in my allotted time. Four things. First of all, some, you know, some brief reflections on the idea of governability and ungovernability. Uh, second, some historical context. Third, a menu of analytical alternatives. And fourth, very briefly, my answer to the question of the conference. Uh, in the course of this, I'm going to commit most, if not all, of the sins that Tom warned against in his remarks, which will give you some flavor of conversation on the eighth floor of 1755 building at Brookings. Uh, and I would just make a preliminary point to frame the whole thing. Namely, the fact, and I think it is an indubitable, the fact that the State of the Union is far from satisfactory. And I've spent the past seven years writing articles and columns on that very point, does not imply that America is ungovernable. Those are two very different propositions. And you need an argument to connect them. Uh, and I hope very much that this conference will endeavor to do so. So what does ungovernable what would it mean for a country to be ungovernable? One thing is for sure, ungovernable does not mean the same thing as undemocratic country. Undemocratic, you know, there are, there are undemocratic but governable countries, and I suspect that there are even areas of life which are democratic and for that reason, ungovernable. Uh, so what are we talking about? Well, one idea of ungovernability is when the rule of law breaks down. Uh, entirely or substantially in a civil war, in circumstances when the writ of the central government extends not to the perimeter of the political community, but much more narrowly. You know, Tommy Karzai is often referred to as the mayor of Kabul, with some justice, you know anything about Afghanistan, or when you have a government whose writ is formally coextensive with the boundaries, but where there is widespread non-compliance. Think, for example, of the Greek government and the tax laws. A second possibility is un an ungovernable country is a country that is unable to make essential decisions. Then the question, of course, is which decisions are essential and which are inessential, which is in some respects a political question. Uh, the third possibility is that we're talking, we're talking about a concept which is a stand-in for a normative claim about the quality of governance. You know, that our government is corrupt, myopic, undemocratic, non-deliberative, fact-denying, even sub-satisficing in the sense that there is in principle a compromise that would be satisfactory to all parties that would make the situation better, but they can't reach it. Uh, so those are, those are some possibilities, and I suspect that what we're talking about is, is some of what I just talked about, a normative claim, plus an empirical claim, that in some ways 
our institutions, our parties, and our political practices and habits have generated an inability to crystallize what is in fact the will of the majority in such a way as it can be translated reliably into public policy. So, uh, the idea of the United States, and this is, this is the segue to part two of my remarks, the idea of the United States as ungovernable has a long history. Uh, one thinks of the despairing young political scientist Woodrow Wilson, who, who, who believed that we would really, in order to break through the morass of late 19th century politics, would have to shift in a parliamentary direction. A uh, hundred years later, Lloyd Cutler, at the end of the Carter administration, made a very similar argument. Uh, and here's a case study for you. The Kennedy administration, uh, James McGregor Burns, in one of the most spectacularly ill-timed books ever written, The Deadlock of Democracy, published in 1963, opined as follows. We're at the critical stage of a somber and inexorable cycle that seems to have dripped the the public affairs of the nation mired in government deadlock. We underestimate the extent to which our system was designed for deadlock and in action. Uh, and Walter Lippmann opined in very much in very much the same way. And it is very interesting to put uh, to put uh, James McGregor Burns and Walter Lippmann of 1963 up against the achievements of 1964 and 1965 in the same way that it is sadly amusing to put Lloyd Cutler's very serious article to form a government published in 1980 up against the Reagan Revolution of 1981 and 1982. Three. Uh, that we're governing ourselves poorly is a matter of wide agreement. But what's the kind of diagnosis? The, the etiology speak as the son of a biologist. Is it a constitutional issue, as Woodrow Wilson and Lloyd Cutler and Sandy, Sandy have argued? Is it more a procedural issue having to do with the way Congress conducts itself, or the way our electoral process is organized? Is it an intellectual issue, as Abraham Lincoln thought it, thought it was when he said that the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present? You know, we must rise to the occasion as our cases do, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves and then we shall save our country, right? Is it, you know, is it that we have problems that we're not thinking through adequately? It is, a, is it a moral problem? Uh, conservatives, liberals, and moderates have a critique of the American people as in different ways the source of our current situation. Or is it a political question? And if so, we're we talking about polarization, which you've heard something about. Uh, are we talking about leadership? Uh, Sandy circulated an argument, uh, an article by Steve Perlstein arguing, arguing that. Is it something about the American party system? Uh, as the American Political Science Association famously argued in 1950 in a well-timed but ill-judged article entitled Towards a More Responsible Party System, Two-Party System, arguing that what we really needed to do was to eliminate these ideological overlaps between the Democratic and the Republican Party. We needed a Liberal Party and the Conservative Party, and then all would be well. Uh, so these are some of the options before us for uh, for the rest of our rest of our discussion, and now how do I connect the dots personally? Uh, if you go back and read the minutes of the Constitutional Convention and the Federalist Papers, what you see is a constant reflection on the relationship between the desire to avoid the worst of all political ills, namely tyranny, on the one hand, and the capacity to act on the other. The basic structure of our Constitution reflects what I call the anti-tyranny principle. Here's what James Madison had to say in Federalist Paper Number 47. The accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands 
whether one, a few, or many, whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elected, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. So if you care about avoiding the black pit of tyranny, you must slice, dice, divide political power, political power to some extent along functional lines, but not entirely. So what has that generated? It has generated a set of institutions that lean toward inaction, but do not do us to inaction. Throughout American history, when leaders with the capacity to act meet a people ready for action, the system moves. And what this generates is what the geologists and evolutionary bi biologists uh, call a system of punctuated equilibrium. That is to say, you know, along, you know, along the tectonic plates, uh, you know, grinding occurs, they are locked, energy builds up, and when the energy reaches a certain point, the plates merge and large changes emerge in the landscape. Whenever we are in a period in which the tension is building up but the plates aren't moving, we are tempted in the direction of the kinds of more global conclusions uh, that some, even on this panel, may want to draw. Uh, and that is especially likely to be the case when the country is in its current circumstances. When it is both deeply divided and closely divided. If the parties are, are, you know, are narrowly divided arithmetically, but they're not so, they're not so deeply opposed to each other, then the evenness doesn't really matter that much. We've had periods in American history like that. If the parties are deeply divided, but not closely divided, as they were in the heyday of the New Deal, and more briefly in the Great Society, then that doesn't matter so much either. You get action that way. But when the parties are both deeply divided and closely divided, then you get, roughly speaking, the situation that we have now. When the American people make up their minds, that one side is right and the other is wrong. Or when they make up their minds that something that they previously thought was wrong is right, gay rights and gay marriage, for example, the system moves very quickly. But if you're in a world in which you add up all of the votes cast for the House of Representatives in the year 2012, 115 million plus, and the gap between the two parties is 1.3 million, that's a pretty good operational definition of closely divided. And under those circumstances, the country will have a hard time acting. Uh, and, and in a system in which constitutional inst institutions create multiple majorities that must concur in order for the system to act, a narrow and deep division is the enemy, enemy of abrupt action. That is a problem that cannot be resolved by institutional contrivances alone, although they can help. Only the American people making up their minds which way they want to go can resolve that kind of malfunction in our government institutions. Thank you. Uh, Bill, thank you very much. I've had all great presentations. We've gone a little bit longer with them than uh, the time of the attendance. So I'm going to collapse almost to the point of nil the portion that I interact I was struck over and over by variance on the, on the, the idea that Nikki uh, began that if not the evil in all of this, but one of the evils is the, the byproduct of redistricting. We live in a state, we sit here in Texas, where we just had more than 200 elections on the ballot in November, and not a dozen of them were protected. For all practical purposes, May is November, or March is November. And the elections really decided in a moment when the extremes of the parties uh, exert their maximum influence over the process and result in the result. Um, what are we going to do about that? It, it, you know, it, it seems to be the case in Congress as well that how many, what percentage, Norm Tom, of the congressional races were non competitive, I mean, it, it, where there was essentially no competition? We seem to be watching the same movie over and over and expecting a different result. 
And if, if we're going to rely on Congress to play the lead role that many of you on this panel suggest it has, uh, and yet we're continuing to return the same division to Congress session after session, how do we get our way out of this? It's not as if they can wake up one day and say, oh, wait a minute, we ought to be behaving differently than we're behaving. Mickey, let me ask you that. Well, well, first of all, in terms of, of a way out of it, uh, 13 states uh, have now done away with uh, partisan uh, legislative redistricting, uh, and some of them have done it. 24 states have uh, provisions for initiative petition, which, which is how that's been done in some states. So, so the people have been taking the reins themselves and they're changing things. Uh, but, you know, I, I want to address one, th one thing you just said there. It's not just competitiveness because re, you know, the drawing of district lines has two purposes. One is, is competitiveness, the other is representativeness, uh, where you have commonalities of interest. So there, there's more than one way to look at, at redistricting. I think the bigger question about the redistricting, just like with the closed primaries, is not whether they're competitive, but what's the nature of the candidates who emerge. Uh, and if the candidates who emerge from that process, from that redistricting, if, if the districting makes the party both, make, makes the district either more safe for the Democrats and or more safe for the Republicans, it will also more likely make it more safe for a, uh, an, an extreme candidate on either side. And I, I just throw this in, this is not part of that question, but I do think uh, if we want to really address the problems that are making the system work, Pointing the finger and saying it's all because party X is nutty, ain't gonna do it. Ain't gonna do it. You know, I, so you know there are, uh, and, and, and you know, Bill has made the point about you know the uh, uh, when the party of the country is divided. There are 40 states that have government, both the governor and, and both houses of the state legislature, in the same hands. 27 of them are held by Republicans, 13 by Democrats. So, you know, and, and we're, we're more a divided nation and the essential idea that the point of view of one party is the reasonable position that all of us should agree with uh, and that those who don't agree with it are somehow nutty and responsible for the dysfunction is simply not a very good or helpful way to look at the problem. But, but Tom, to make this point, what I did not hear for the last hour up here was a lot of criticism of the Democrats. What I heard, in fact, implied or explicit was the Republicans are nuts, they're in control of too much of this, and that's the problem. Yeah, the, the first book that made that point was my book, Reclaiming Conservatism, five years ago, uh, which I, I acknowledge the problems I in my party. That book. Yeah, I, uh, I acknowledge the problems in my party. The problems are not all in my party, the problems of divisiveness and uncooperation and all are a bigger problem than that and affects both parties. The blue dogs are gone from Congress. I mean, you know, we, to solve the problem, we, we have to look at what's producing these outcomes and it narrows our focus if we merely say, well, all you have to do is get this one side of the equation to shape up and we'll be okay. I think the problems are more significant than that. Tom, it's too simplistic of you to say that that's just a problem, right? It's just a See, it's so safe. It's so safe. First of all, let me answer your gerrymandering question. Um, it's, there's a lot of research on this, and the research overwhelmingly says that sort of gerrymandering, incumbent and partisan gerrymandering, are not major sources of the increase in uncompetitive districts. And, the House and in state legislatures, that what is, is two other things are much more important. One is, is the fact that individuals, both psychologically and physically, have sorted themselves out into areas of like minded citizens. Um, the same party uh, has the liberals and moderates. Uh, lefts of center, if you will, and the Republican Party has the sort of right of, of center. This is partly initially in the, in the South, it was, it was part of a, a realignment leaving people out of a party and, uh, and into another, but over time, 
right, we have, we have become um, so geographically distinctive in our, in our communities that just normal, nonpartisan redistricting would produce lopsided districts. So that's number one, and therefore, it's a mistake to put too much emphasis on that. I see partisan gerrymandering. It's obviously a problematic in a particular year if you're a Democrat and you lo lost the 2010 elections and you lost that round of redistricting, and so it hampers your opportunity win a majority, but it, it bounces back and forth, and it doesn't explain the competitiveness, and Mickey's made that point. Um, uh, the other th point Mickey made is you can take the same competitive districts, and you would think, gee, the Republicans representing those districts would, would be less ideologically extreme, and, uh, uh, and Democrats uh, the same way. It turns out it's not. It's not true. It's much more important to know whether a member is a Democrat or a Republican than whether he's from a, from a safe or a competitive district. And so that it turns out to be the case. The, the, the final point is just uh, every time you make this argument, I was uh, uh, about party asymmetry. Um, uh, it, it's really easy and comfortable to set it aside. It really is. Mickey thinks it's easy to say it, but then why the hell doesn't anyone say it? Uh, if it's so easy to say it, the press never says it because they'll be accused of partisan bias. Uh, and so it's he says, she says, the Republicans say this and the Democrats say this, but the scientists who believe climate change is real say this, and but the others say that, and, and that's the sort of message, and I think we ought to confront ourselves on that. And of course Democrats aren't perfect. Of course they went through a period of change and excess back in the 60s and 70s, but right now it's different. And all you have to do is listen, parse the arguments and the proposals uh, and the statements, and then try to relate them to reality, and it's amazing. Two quick points. First of all, I think part of the problem is due to an obscure statute passed in 1842 that requires single member districts for the House of Representatives. There's no reason that Texas should have whatever is 34 or 35 individual districts, or California have 54 districts. One could easily imagine carving up Texas into its five regions, each of which elected six or seven representatives on some kind of proportional representation basis, and that would assure not only a fairer distribution of Democrats and Republicans, but also something I wouldn't mind seeing, which is breaking the two-party duopoly, and the possibility that in a more you know, uh, mildly proportional system, you could have some dissident voices either from the Ron Paul libertarian right or a more truly radical left. Um, this would not require a constitutional amendment, incidentally. Um, Larry West and I want a new constitutional convention. You might, you might have a majority of the law professors in the country who want that in this room right now, but this particular, <laughs> but this particular change would simply require congressional action, but then you get the whole point. Can you get a mass movement that would lead Congress so radically to change the nature of the American Party structure? Now, in California, Bruce Cain will speak about California um, tomorrow or Saturday. There is a possibility, which is direct democracy, uh, for better and for worse. But the second point I want to make, I mean, Alan mentioned the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and he's absolutely right. Bill mentioned 1964. You know, I was in that crowd stopping Robert McNamara because I hated the Vietnam War, and I haven't changed my view of that. It's also true that Lyndon Johnson was the greatest domestic policy president in my lifetime, but the importance of the Voting Rights Act was, you know, the legend has it, and none people have said it, but I assume it's kind of true, that when he signed it, he said, I am destroying the Democratic Party as he exists. Um, you know, there were some things he did that were clever political moves. Signing the Voting Rights Act of 1965 wasn't one of them. 
we forget that in 1968, Richard Nixon and George Corley Wallace, between them, got 57% of the vote. And Richard Nixon ran his campaign on the basis of Kevin Phillips' Southern strategy and picked Spiro Agnew, notably unqualified to be President of the United States, because he had taunted black leaders in Baltimore as governor of Maryland. So, I mean, with all respect, you wrote your book saying the Republican Party had to uh, change. But will any Republican leaders be willing to do what Lyndon Johnson was willing to do? I mean, he was a legislative master, and I read Robert Cato's book, and he had the good fortune to run against Barry Goldwater, etc. But he was also willing to destroy his party as it existed at that time. And that's part of what we are talking about, you know, what Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction. And do we have such a congealed party system and political system that there's no possibility of creative destruction? Norm, as you know from the race that, that Speaker Boehner won, much more close race than you expected the Speaker, even the mere hint of moving in the direction of what Sandy is talking about gets you in making these parlance and the parlance of the moment primary, and that fear seems to be the fear greatest of all in the Actually. Yeah, and I think that that's part of a larger point. Uh, we do exaggerate the impact of redistricting, which leads us down a bad path, which is if we could only solve that problem, everything would be fine. Redistricting or the districting process didn't do in Bob Bennett. Uh, it didn't cause Arlen Specter to uh, shift from the Republican to the Democratic Party. Uh, it didn't almost bring down Lisa Murkowski, who uh, for her good fortune did not have a sore loser could do it in a state where there was a write-in uh, uh, ballot. Um, the, we, we have a problem with primaries, and Tom and I have grappled with that, and we've had a number of suggestions. One, which is extremely unlikely to happen, would be to adopt at all levels the Australian system of mandatory attendance at the polls. Uh, and uh, <laughs> if you expand the electorate, uh, you get different, uh, not only different outcomes, you get different incentives. Politicians in Australia will tell you that when they know that both bases will be out, you change the issues you talk about and the rhetoric you use to aim at persuadable voters. Short of that, some variations of an open primary system, um, my preference would be not a top two, uh, but something a little bit broader, but also with uh, preference voting um, would be very helpful here. But I think we can't ignore one other larger problem. And that is, we are in danger, I think, of dramatically narrowing the base of people who are willing to run for office now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, money is a major, major part of this. You know, I sometimes say when I uh, talk to groups that it really was the case when Tom and I first came to Washington in the late 1960s, you had many instances where leaders in a community would go to somebody, a law professor, a lawyer, uh, a business person, and say, we've watched you, you've really done good things, now it's time to give a little bit back, we'd like you to run for office, come to Congress, do something good. And now if you think about how that would work, you would go to somebody in the community and say, we'd like you to run for office. The first thing that's gonna happen is you've gotta realize that there are gonna be, your opponent and many other groups out there raising millions of dollars with the explicit goal of trashing the reputation you have spent decades building up. And they will dance a victory jig if your kids come home from school one day crying and saying they can't go back because they're being teased mercilessly about the awful parent they have who's now running for office. And of course, you'll have to do some version of the same against your opponent. And maybe you can pull it through and you'll get to Washington. And what will happen? Nothing. You're going to be up against the other tribe, and you're going to be running back and forth between two homes, both of which are expensive, and every spare minute, call time. So you can raise money for yourself, for your tribe, and then ultimately for insurance against some anonymous predator outside group that will parachute in two weeks before the election with millions of dollars that you can't possibly raise, so you better get the insurance money. Now, 
you tell me if that's a pretty reasonable incentive to get somebody who's built a strong reputation in a community and wants to solve problems to run. And until we change something more than the districts and alter the landscape that goes even beyond the primaries, we've got a big problem on our hands. And it's frankly nothing short of miraculous that we continue to get some reasonably good people willing to do this. But I see every class coming in, that group is attenuated. Jack Wolf, Jordan now pressed the hill Well, uh, I, I wanted to address this deep theoretical issue of whether our problem is that one of our parties has lost its marbles. Um, and um, I just want to point out, um, as someone who's inclined to think that way, uh, that when we look at the presidential level, the last Republican candidates for president were George W. Bush, who ran as a compassionate conservative, uh, a move toward the center of his party. John McCain, the sort of very embodiment of a Theodore Roosevelt type republicanism that was long associated with the Navy uh, and with a, a prominent leadership role in the United States. And the former governor of my commonwealth, Mitt Romney, son of one of the most progressive Republicans we've ever had. Now, if this party is in danger of falling victim to a kind of extremism, or if it has fallen victim to a kind of extremism, it's actually not been reflected in the people it chooses for office. And you might say, good news, bad news, that that's good news, that the Republicans are still um, uh, nominating pretty credible people uh, with distinguished backgrounds. But it seems to me it's even more tragic. Uh, in a sense, because these are people chosen to lead a party who cannot lead their party, who are being led by their party. Uh, and that's why I'm somewhat skeptical that we might soon reach a period where this party that some of us on this panel believe is a little more at fault than the other one uh, for some of the uh, dysfunctions we're seeing, uh, that it's going to go through any kind of significant reform. After all, it hasn't done the one thing that I think a lot of Republicans would like to do, and that's nominate for president a real red-blooded uh, conservative uh, that, that um, uh, they could be happy with. So I, I, I think we sort of have to go through that. Is that not a possibility, you know, the, the, what the conservatives, Eric Erickson and the others say, that the lesson of these last couple of elections is that if you nominate a fake Republican, you're going to lose, mm -hmm. and that given the result of the last two elections, we need to nominate somebody more in the vein of Rick Santorum or Marco Rubio or somebody, because we can't do any worse than we've done with it Romney and Trump again. Well, this is the first of Tom Mann's two scenarios, right, that the Republicans sort of have to go further uh, before <laughs> we can begin to see a, a greater equilibrium. I sort of think that's probably likely to happen. Bill, you want to say something before we give the audience an opportunity? No, I think the tax will pay. Good. Okay. <laughs> Having tax for patients, let's now solicit some questions. We're going to have an enormous amount of time, but we'll try to get through. Uh, my name is Carl Jarvis. I'm uh, actually an independent constitutional scholar. Uh, pursued my research for about seven years, and I'm getting ready to publish my first book. Uh, it's actually an optimistic book. It's very solution focused, and uh, the reason why it is is because it focuses exclusively on political institutions, and in particular, institutions that have developed outside the constitution. And one of the areas in my research, there's eight different areas, but one of them is the history of the nominating process. And uh, I found that if you look at that full history, uh, you look at these issues of campaign finance that we're talking about, these emotional issues that dominate politics today, if you look at polarization, and even some of the issues with the balance of power between Congress and the President, a lot of that can be traced back to the enactment of direct primary laws. And one thing that I have not seen in any of the literature I've read uh, is that you know, there, there's this debate between closed primaries and open primaries, and then even this talk of blanket primaries. I've never seen a real discussion uh, in any book published since 1930 of a discussion between the direct primary and the indirect primary. And I would suggest, you know, I would commend to your um, attention, and maybe we can talk about it, this idea of the indirect primary and the kind of effect that that would have on our our, on our entire political system. So that's your question. What would, what would be the effect of an indirect primary on our system? Let's throw it up as a jump ball, anybody who wants to get it. Well, I understand the question. It's the original vision of the Electoral College, which was an indirect primary. You go for local notables who would, in fact, pick the person best equipped to be president. That vision lasted no longer than 1800. 
And I just find it very hard to imagine that we're a country that would accept the proposition that it ought to be up to local notables to name candidates rather, I mean, even if you think it's a good idea, I just find it hard to imagine that a culture as robustly little be democratic as our own would go that route. Yeah. Well, very, very quickly, uh, I may shock some people with what I'm about to say, but if I were in a control booth with two buttons, A and B, and A is the presidential nominating system we have right now, and B is the system we had before 1968, I'd press B without a moment's hesitation. Was it less democratic? In some ways, yes. In others, I would argue more democratic, but it worked a whole lot better than what we have. To what extent does our competition or economic relationship with China affect people's thinking about how aligned our government and our, our corporate interests should be? And would that affect uh, the thinking of uh, I, I think I can that, that Schmidt. Schmidt. You know, so if your government and your corporate interests are perfectly aligned, you may not have a lot of freedom, which may be a much more efficient economic machine. And we're well, certainly competing with very what should the proper calibration be between the government and our business? Or, or is that starting to filter into people's thinking about how we should balance freedom? Well, you, 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 you had a headlight state of readiness. I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, it goes back to, um, you know, the, you're balancing a couple of things. You know, we, we, we're a republic, but we're also a democracy uh, where we want the will of the people to uh, prevail in a collective way, but we also want to be able to protect the liberties of, our, of the people, as, as Madison pointed out in his bill, uh, bill quoted him. So I, I think we, there are lots of ways that we could come up with a system that would be much more efficient. There's no question about it. You know, we, we, we could have major new uh, laws passed every day. We, we, we could just you know, fix every problem. You, know, you don't like this building here, just order it moved. I mean, we could do all kinds of things. That doesn't fit with, with our system. Our system is based on uh, individual rights uh, as well as collective action. I think we are not uh, a people who would put giving government control, I mean, this concentration of power to just govern everything in our lives uh, over so that government would be more efficient. We, we, we live with the inefficiencies because the benefit of living with the inefficiencies is pretty good. And the 10th Amendment, guys, is that we're sort of moving in the opposite direction, less control. Well, very briefly, uh, you know, I seem to be in a historical mood this afternoon. And we've seen this before as well. I mean, during the, during the 1930s, there was an enormous attraction in the United States of both fascism and communism as you know, more efficient and effective ways of, of, of organizing a politics and the relationship between politics and, you know, and the economy. In the 1980s, there was a burst of Germany envy and Japan envy. And people were writing books with the title, you know, Japan number one, uh, et, et cetera. And, you know, and, and people were looking at German corporatism as a model for the reform of, of American public policy. And now the wheel is turned again, and China emerges as the latest, more efficient alternative to our ramshackle democracy. Uh, one problem with all of these alternatives to democracy is that they pluck the low-hanging fruit. And then they run into big trouble, right? Because you can, you know, because efficiency and tunnel vision have something to do with each other. Uh, and the Chinese are beginning, beginning to discover that you can go pell-mell for industrialization and destroy neighborhoods, forget, you know, use eminent domain in ways that nobody's ever imagined before. And now they have air they can't breathe, and a local populace in revolt in cities all across the country. So you know that efficiency always comes with a price, 
that in the broader scheme of things and in the light of history, it's not worth paying. One, one second. Yeah, I just uh, to uh, put a little twist on this. Uh, about 50 years ago, uh, we had a major controversy caused when the chairman of uh, the General Motors said, what's good for General Motors is good for the country and vice versa, and people just went ballistic. Um, well, there's some truth to that. Um, but that was in an earlier era. We now live in a global economy where corporations are not based in a single country, major companies, uh, but they're people, according to the Supreme Court. And uh, they don't have the same rules, however, as the rest of us. And when uh, President Obama, in his State of the Union message, took the Supreme Court to task for the Citizens United uh, decision, and suggested that this might uh, open an avenue for foreign uh, companies to get involved, and Justice Alito famously mouthed, not true, he was wrong. Uh, in fact, there are lots of ways for uh, foreign uh, companies that have American subsidiaries to get very much involved, and where we're gonna see companies that have motivations that are not necessarily what's good for them is good for the country, because those motivations might well rest outside the boundaries of the United States. And it's not just companies, I would say, it's wealthy individuals. Uh, we have a major funder from Las Vegas who poured $150 million into the last campaign. It was not money particularly well spent, but Sheldon Adelson's money now comes largely from Macau. And anybody who thinks that spending that money, if he had uh, managed to prevail, uh, and had his candidates win, that he wouldn't have had access, and in that access might have uh, wanted to pursue interests that would have been of significant benefit relating to America-Chinese relations, is I think hopelessly naive. So here's another area where we simply have to be, I think, a little bit vigilant and concerned about <coughs> what direction could go. Sandy, I think we have time. something in the Democratic Party that makes them better. Because I wonder, if you look at the history leading up to this, there's a series of tit for tats. Each party and each time out behaves in a more extreme way. Nobody can believe that they're behaving that way, but then when they get into the same position, they do exactly the same thing. So it might be the Republicans will never regain control. I don't know. But if the Republicans regained control and it were reversed, is there a reason you believe the Democrats wouldn't behave just as badly yeah. in order to push the model of facilitating the funding necessary to get back into power. I'll take a, a first crack at that. One thing I want to say is it's not a matter, I believe, of ideology. When Mickey Edwards was in Congress, he was one of the more conservative members of the Republican Party. Now, if Mickey were in Congress now, he would be a dramatic outlier. I wouldn't be in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he would fit your working definition of socialist at this point. Yes. <laughs> And it's not that Mickey's changed uh, particularly. I don't think his views on most issues are significantly different than he was. So that's one part of this. Another part of it is there may be something that is a little bit different uh, here between the two parties. Uh, Democrats want good government. They want government to work. You get compromises that still allow for a significant role of government, and you're gonna find in general, I think, more of an interest in doing that than those who just want less government. Although the dilemma that they have is they want less government in the abstract until you get down to specific levels. Yeah. But at another level, I don't see any reason to imagine, and Tom pointed in previous eras where the Democratic Party careened out of the mainstream and out of control, you could go back to the 1890s uh, as well as the 60s or 70s. And one of the things that I think we feared was that if McConnell, if McConnell's gamble had paid off and uh, Mitt Romney, who was 
uh, as Alan has said, uh, not his own man in this case, would have been, I think, a waif among forces, uh, had been faced with a Republican House and Senate. Democrats would have looked at that and said, well, now we see what works. Uh, and I think you would have seen a comparable set of behaviors moving to the other side. So uh, I, I see potential there on both sides. But the fact is, for a variety of reasons, including, I think, being the out party for 40 years and developing a minority mentality, having this new media that developed that could reinforce all those notions of being agreed, which is what Fox and Limbaugh and the other talk radio show hosts do, that have taken hold much more than a liberal uh, or left-wing media have done, all provide ingredients for making Republicans distinct now, but there's nothing inherent. Yeah, I want to put in an analytic defense of Mitch McConnell for a moment. My view is that Teddy Kennedy elected George W. Bush in 2004, that he did it by cooperating with Bush on two signature achievements, what everyone thinks of, it doesn't matter. No Child Left Behind and the Prescription Drug Bill. And Bush could run in 2004, not only as the hero of the war against terrorism, but also somebody who was, in fact, willing to reach across the aisle and to get a receptive voice. McConnell, I think, had no desire to repeat this and correctly believed that to cooperate slash collaborate with Obama would have been just to pave the way for a much more impressive victory than he in fact got. I also think that the rationality of McConnell's response is due to an important feature of the United States Constitution that is different from 48 of the 50 states, including Texas, which is at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, the governor gets to appoint no cabinet officials other than the Secretary of State in Texas. We have the most non-unitary executive in the Western world. And there's something to be said for that because it diminishes the psychodrama of a given gubernatorial election because it's not winner take all. Whereas presidential elections are winner take all. And if you want to have a Republican Secretary of Treasury, even a Republican Secretary of Transportation, actually, you get a Republican Secretary of Transportation. It seems to have become a tradition in Democratic administrations. But if you want to have your voice heard in executive departments with the perception that in the modern world, for whatever reason, the executive branch controls a hell of a lot of what gets done, you've got to win the presidential election, and you're going to win the presidential election only if an incumbent running for re-election has no achievements to his, or perhaps in 2020, her name. And so I think that Mitch McConnell is not an evil person. I think given the incentive structure of the Constitution of the United States and his own perception of what happened. Newt Gingrich gave Bill Clinton a bill that he was willing to sign on so-called welfare reform. Again, you can applaud it or not, but he waltzed to re-election because he compromised with Gingrich and presidents will always get an excessive amount of the credit for anything that can be labeled an achievement. Uh, I, I see others wanting to go past first. our time, but we have to read the probing. Well, brief, I hope, probing, you be the judge. Uh, with regard to that episode that Sandy just started, there was a very interesting dynamic at work. Uh, the Dole campaign pleaded with Gingrich not to give Clinton a third bite of the apple. And Gingrich, reckoning correctly, that the interest of his troops would be better served by you know, collaborating with Clinton on welfare reform, uh, pitched his presidential candidate overboard. 
And so it's, you know, it, it's, you know, our institutional differentiation comp complexifies the motivations to elect a president. You don't want to de-elect yourself, right? But, you know, but back to Larry's question, and, you know, a third, a third historical reflection, which is also a, you know, a, a vaguely an economic reflection. It seems to me that one of the better established maxims or conclusions of behavioral economics and a number of other lines of argument and research as well is that fear of loss is a more powerful motivator than hope of gain. And so if you have one party representing a tendency or perhaps even a piece of the population that believes that it is on the verge of or in danger of losing control, losing control of something you feel entitled to, that can generate various forms of thinking and, and behavior uh, that are defensive in the worst sense. And, you know, and, and the more seriously we take the Teixeira Judas thesis of a new emerging democratic majority, the more we have to reckon with what that means for people who think they're on the other side of it. And I wrote an email to a journalist uh, in which I reflected on what it would be like to be a 55-year-old white guy from Oklahoma listening to Obama's second inaugural address and the atmospheric surrounding it, right? A civil, the, the wife of a martyred civil rights icon, a black choir from Brooklyn singing the battle hymn of the Republic, uh, a gay, you know, Cuban extracted poet reading the poem, a Latino minister delivering the benediction. That was the bread, and then that speech in the middle. What did that feel like? I think we have to think about it. Um, yeah, it, it'll be brief and, and probably not uh, profound, but uh, uh, trying to go to Larry's question. By the way, I, I, I loved the, the speech and all those things. I thought it did a great job. But, uh, I, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I know I know I'm in Texas. You should not point out that I'm from Oklahoma. Although although your stadium was named for the former Oklahoma quarterback, I'll just point that out. Uh, I, Larry, let, let me say suggest that one way to judge how uh, Democrats might act in the future is to look at how they have acted in the past. Uh, here in Texas, you're very familiar with uh, a fairly outrageous redistricting that Tom DeLay pulled off, uh, which had its antecedents uh, in the redistricting that Philip Burton did in California uh, as a Democrat. Uh, today, the, uh, it appears that the Senate is going to be able to agree to cut back on the use of filibusters. That's in exchange for Harry Reid agreeing, I'll let you offer amendments. Uh, how did this guy, and I've, I've been very outspoken that I think Newt Gingrich has been a walking disaster. You know, how, how did Newt Gingrich rise to power? He rose to power because of anger among his people about the fact that the Democrats, mostly Texan Jim Wright, who was then speaker, would now allow Republicans to even offer amendments on the floor. And, and so I, I would suggest we have plenty of history to show that uh, Democrats, when, when it was in their interest to do so, have, exact, have acted almost exactly the same way. So I don't think it's what makes a Republican or makes a Democrat. It is the, the calculus of what you need to do uh, to gain or stay in power. Sandy, should we land the plane? Pardon? Should we land the plane? Yes, no, let me invite everybody to return to the Iron courtroom tomorrow. I think it's at 9.15. Um, Yes, for a panel on compromise and governance, which obviously will continue some of this conversation. Let's acknowledge the